Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text on which we base the meditation today is the Epistle Lesson on this Transfiguration Sunday. I'd like to repeat the first verse, but I'd also like to read the verses prior to this in verses 12 to 15. Peter says to whoever reads this letter, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them, and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. This is God's word. <clears throat> this past Wednesday, I had the devotion over at Grace Lutheran School and the text that was given to me in the PowerPoint presentation had to deal with the transfiguration. And I guess one of the nice things about PowerPoint presentation is that with the extra visuals, you have a visual as they had in their PowerPoint presentation of James, Peter, John on this top of the mountain in what would be normal looking attire for their age. And you had Jesus, Moses, and Elijah really lit up. And I think of Transfiguration Sunday, that it's not what we would consider a major festival in our church here. We have no decorations. We didn't send any cards to anybody else. Happy Transfiguration Day, at least I didn't. I don't know if you did. I don't even think Hallmark figured that out, that they could maybe make a buck on you know, a day that we don't really do much with. Happy Transfiguration Day. May your Transfiguration Day be glowing. You know, you could put all those other things. I did see in a store once, a Christian bookstore, that you can buy a lamp for a children's room that you can press a button and the base of it, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah do light up. And then you can turn it off again and use the top part of the lamp where the bulb was. But that's as far as I've seen, as far as transfiguration. And I think of it even when I was in Sunday school as sort of a, you know, one of those minor miracles, Jesus glowed, okay. Then he stopped glowing and they went back down the hill and Jesus said, don't tell everybody who I am yet, as far as the Christ is concerned. So I was thinking about the kids at school and thinking about Jesus, what, what am I supposed to learn from Jesus glowing and talking to Moses and Elijah? And I went this route with the kids. I said, is anything in school here hard? Well, a bunch of hands, because we do interactive devotions over there. So I got math, handwriting, math, English, algebra, social studies, math, a lot of math. Handwriting and penmanship struck me as being one that I didn't expect. I expect social studies, English, most of the subjects they have, somebody's probably not good in them and they're hard. Anything in your life, also hard, like learning how to play the piano. Learning how to dribble a basketball for the little ones and even <coughs> maybe even upper graders. Uh, eating vegetables? That hard? I said yes. Do you think Jesus ever found anything in life hard to do? And I expected the answer from most of the younger ones was no. Jesus never found anything in hard life. Well, why not? Well, because he was perfect. So everything was easy. I said, well, then how come he prayed to God for help? And one, I don't know, fourth or fifth grader raised his hand and he says, he was just showing the disciples how to do it. He really didn't need to do it. <laughs> I like that answer, in a way. So, and, I, and I went with it. So Jesus was just faking it when he prayed to God so that the disciples would see how to do it better? Uh-huh. So that Garden of Gethsemane thing, oh yeah, okay, that was, that was sort of looking, that, we know that one was sort of real. But it says so many times when you read about the life of Christ, before we get to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus went up to a mountain to pray. Jesus went off by himself to pray. Jesus went off to pray, Jesus went to pray, Jesus started the day with prayer, which is why the disciples said, teach us how to pray. And it wasn't that they hadn't been taught prayers, meal prayers, 
going in the temple prayers and they would pray with their arms spread because that's what they did in those days as opposed to something like this that we do today to keep our hands sort of from being too busy while we talk to God. But Jesus prayed in a different way. Pharisees prayed on street corners. You could hear those awesome prayers. You have one of those prayers in that story that Jesus taught about the Pharisee and the publican in the church and the Pharisee talked to God about thanking him for the wonderful man that he had made. And he wasn't like those publicans and everybody else. Thank you for God for doing such a good job in making me who I am. I'm both very pleased with me. You must be pleased with me too. They had heard those prayers. They didn't want to pray that way. But did Jesus ever think life was hard? And they started to understand, yeah. Because even though he was perfect without sin, and even though he was almighty, there were parts of life that was still hard. And then I asked them to do something with me, and that is think about what Moses and Elijah talked about with Jesus, because it's not there in the Gospel lesson. What did they talk about? And so I asked them, tell me the things you remember about Moses. And they remember Moses killing somebody, and then having to flee for his life, and living out there taking care of sheep. And I asked them about the burning bush, and how Moses was eager to take on that job. No, they remembered that Moses had lots of good excuses because he didn't want this job. He knew it was going to be hard. And after Moses took the job, did he find out, oh, this is an easy job. And they helped remind everybody else to know that Moses did not think this was a, an easy job. He didn't like dealing with Pharaoh, trapped at the Red Sea, asking for food, asking for water, getting mad at the people. Oh, they remembered the time where Moses took the, the first set of commandments and broke them because he was so upset because of the golden calf. And I said, imagine that. You get so mad that you lose your temper and you break the... Oh, no. Now what do I do? God gave me the Ten Commandments and the other commands on tablets and I blew it. I mean, they may have worshipped the golden calf, but I just busted the law. <laughs> Talk about breaking the commandments. But he went back to get some more. <laughs> did Moses find life hard working for God? Yes, he did. And what about Elijah? Well, they didn't, they didn't know as much about Elijah. I don't think the average person knows much about it. There's not as much written about Elijah. I mean, there is that wonderful story about where he challenges the prophets of Baal to that offering contest. You make an offering, I'll make an offering. Had it rained for three years because God was punishing Israel. That's why Elijah had fled for his life and was fed by the ravens and fed by the widow along the way. But they have that contest. Okay, we'll pray to our gods and whoever's God lights the fire on the offering, that's the true God. And he let the prophets of Baal go first and nothing, nothing, nothing happened. And Elijah was not above a little mockery there too. Maybe your God's on vacation. Uh, maybe he's sleeping, you need to yell a little louder. Uh, a couple other things he picked on about with the prophets of Baal. And then as, at the beginning of Elijah's prayer for God to show himself, fire came from the sky, not just lit the wood, consumed the sacrifice, consumed the wood, burned up the rocks and even the water Moses had put in a ditch around that. I mean, Elijah had put around that. And even though the people rallied for a bit to show the prophets of Baal, we want you out of here, it did, not take, it did not change King Ahab or Queen Jezebel's minds about worshiping their Baal and now wanting to kill Elijah. So they put up a wanted poster. Wanted. Prophet Elijah, dead. Not dead or alive, just dead. And Elijah has to take a run for it. Heads down to Mount Sinai himself. Has a little visitation with God. And then God's basic answer is, get back to work. I got this for you to do, and I got this for you to do. He gives him a grocery list of things to do. So back to Israel and anoint this person the next prophet, anoint this person the next king. I still got work for you. And Elijah was like, I just want to be gone now. I want to die and be in heaven. And God said, no, I got stuff for you to do. Was Elijah's life hard? Was Moses' life hard? Jesus is six months away from his suffering and death, and he's thinking about it, what he has to do next. 
So in my imagination, because I still have to say this is my imagination, says that's what they talked about. That Moses and Elijah talked about the fact that their jobs were hard. Jesus, your job is hard, but you can do it. That there was encouragement. Now my imagination also goes to the fact, remember you made us do our jobs. Now it's time for you to do yours. We didn't want to do the jobs you assigned to us, so you better get your job done. And maybe they even threw in something like this. If you don't get to Jerusalem and die for our sins, we don't get to stay in heaven. Now again, put that in my imagination, not biblical fact. Especially that part where if you don't die, we get kicked out of heaven. So you better get that job done, hard or not. No, I do believe that what they really did simply talk about was encouragement, to encourage one another. And with the kids, I ask that. Does anybody encourage you to help you with your math? When you think Pam and is far, does anybody encourage you to keep going at it? And they had answers. Classmates, brothers, sisters, teachers. I was disappointed that they got to mom and dad last out of those <laughs> suggestions, but it did make me think, yeah, they do understand that even classmates and brothers and sisters, besides the adult authority figures of teacher, mom and dad, encourage them to keep going, to get through the hard part. Nobody says it's easy. I just say it's hard, but you keep going. With Jesus here, too. Jesus, you have to get this job done. The world, not just us two, Moses and Elijah, are depending, but the world's depending upon you. When I go down this path once in a while with my imagination, though, I remind myself sometimes I'm acting as foolish as Peter was when he said, oh, let's build three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Oh, that didn't sound right, did it? <laughs> now, Matthew doesn't say that comment about Peter, that Peter didn't know what he was saying. Which gospel says that? It's Mark. Where did Mark get his information about what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration? Because he wasn't a disciple, he wasn't there. Yeah, he was, I'll say it this way, Peter's secretary. Sometimes we always think of the four Gospels as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sometimes I think of the four Gospels as Matthew, Peter, Luke, and John. Peter dictated to Mark the Gospel that was written that we named Mark. Shortest Gospel of the four was Peter was a man of action, not a man of a lot of words. Didn't get into a lot of the healing miracles in the bedside manner of Jesus like Dr. Luke did when he wrote his Gospel. Or talking about the love and the caring and the compassion of Jesus like John, the disciple whom he loved. Or even Matthew, the tax collector, that brought in all those Old Testament prophecies about how God is the Savior of all people, not just them Pharisees or people who do what's right. But Peter, or Mark's Gospel, is here's the facts. Here's the stuff I saw. Here's the stuff that I was witness to. So you can understand that Jesus is more than a great human being. More than a great man, he was God incarnate. And Peter's not afraid to show in his flaws, which is why in Mark's Gospel you will still read about Peter didn't know what he was saying. Just like when I think about these things I speculate, sometimes I have to admit I'm not sure I know what I'm saying, but it's something I say at the time because I'm trying to understand who it is that I'm really worshiping. Because when I see pictures of Jesus, I think... Brown hair, about this long, dark eyes, beard. About how old? You think God the Father, you think? Long white beard, long white hair. And you think of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Sorry, it, it's the bird, right? <laughs> it's a dove. The Holy Spirit is more than a dove, and you and I know that. God the Father is just us, not an old, but that's where we put him because he's from eternity. But Jesus gets locked in at that age 33, except at Christmas when he's about this big and we put him in our nativity sets. But most of the time he's 33 years old. How tall? Buff or not buff? 
I mean, sometimes we have Jesus, you know, the, I see this in certain movies where he's just this thin, skinny talking guy because that's what he did is he sat on hills and preached to people. And yet, what was his occupation before he became a minister? Construction. Without power tools. Yeah, weak, skinny guy. Uh-huh. Sanding, sawing, drilling, everything by hand. Oh, have a different image of Jesus when he comes in and upsets the tables in the temple with the money changers. And he's a guy on a terror <laughs> and somebody to be dealt with. Yet he does meekly allow himself to be arrested. He does allow himself to be crucified because that was his task. That was his job. Jesus is man. I can see that. We professed it in our creed where we said Jesus is fully human. But the transfiguration also reminds me, as it reminded those three disciples that day, you're following God. God incarnate. They had trouble wrapping their heads around that. So do I. When I come here this morning again, I want to serve God. Not just Jesus, the man who died on the cross. I want to serve God with my prayers. I want to serve him with how I sing my hymns. I want to serve him with my life because of what he has already done for me. And I am reminded of the fact that I need to be told this from time to time and again and again. Peter was not afraid to say that outright in print to the people as I read in verse 12. So I will always remind you of these things even though you know them. He was not afraid of repeating himself. I as a pastor am not afraid of repeating myself. You know that, don't you? And I'm going to keep it up with certain stories, with certain lessons, but just the main facts that Jesus died for our sins and he loves us. I'm never going to get tired of repeating that. I need to hear it that Jesus loves me, that God the Father loves me, that the Holy Spirit loves me enough to stay with me every day and help me stay on that path that leads to eternal life. And I need you to tell each other that and remind ourselves of these same things. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Peter knew at this point in his life he was getting near the end of his earthly life. We don't know from the Bible what we do know from tradition that Peter also got crucified. Peter was still Peter, though, when that happened, because tradition tells us, he says, I'm not worthy of being killed in the same way that my Lord is being killed. So they crucified him upside down. Because Peter was still Peter. The goofball who walked on the water and sunk the one who said, I'll never betray you, and did. The one who did many other things that we can read about in his word and see where Peter made these mistakes and sort of us goofball. And as I was a kid in Sunday school, I'm never going to be like Peter, was an awesome apostle. An awesome apostle. And I will never get up to the level of how awesome Peter was. But it wasn't what he did that made Jesus love him. Jesus loved Peter just the way he was. Maybe he wanted Peter to change some of the rough edges or something, but he never really said, Peter, you need a personality transplant. He never told Peter, I don't like you. I like some parts of you, but I don't like other parts of you. He loved Peter as he had made him. Just use Peter to get funneled in that right direction the way he did. So Peter's not afraid to tell everybody about the way he was because he wanted everybody to know, God loved me that way, the way I am. So that you and I know God loves us with our personalities too. Now if there's something that we do that is not Christian, well, we need to work on that. And if there's some things that would do, we could do to make ourselves act more like Christ, well, we need to work on that. But our basic personalities, God loves us. He died for us. Peter understood that. When he got reinstated between that resurrection and that ascension. Peter, do you love me? 
Oh, you know, I don't love you as much as you love me because you're better at loving me. That wasn't all there, but you don't remember that Greek thing, and I won't repeat that today. Peter got it. Then get out there and tell everybody about how much I love you because that's still the most important thing. So what does Peter put in this epistle? We didn't follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. In a way, Peter's saying, because we would have written them better if we were making them up. You think I would have told you all about all the things I did wrong if we were trying to put together a better story? No. We're not writing cleverly devised stories. You can't make this stuff up. Who is Jesus? Somebody who glowed. Why would you make that up? Because whoever you see glow, that's who you're supposed to worship. <laughs> but they told us about this simple thing. And then, what did it mean? He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. So Peter reminds us that glowing wasn't the special thing that day. It was God the Father speaking from heaven and saying, This is my Son, listen to him. Keep listening to him, and you'll be saved. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, and Peter helps us understand this whole thing we call verbal inspiration, saying the writers of the Bible, all 40 plus of them, from Moses to the time that John finishes the book of Revelation, are human. And then here's the greatest statement that I want you to take home today. Because it's the statement that reassures me that what I'm reading in this book is different than anything else I can read in this world. They spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please arise. May the love of God, which he has for you and for me, keep your hearts and minds focused on Christ Jesus. Amen.